Now, I don't know for sure because the Bible doesn't really say, but it is likely that it was there at the feast of the Passover when Jesus was 12 years old that it began to dawn on him who he really was. Imagine how he must have felt when it dawned upon him that the sacrificial lamb lying there on the altar, that it represented himself and that it was a symbol of his own death. Now look again at his response to his parents in Luke chapter 2 and verse 49. He said, How is it that you sought me? Wished you not that I must be about my father's business? Now it's evident from this that at this point he did understand what his earthly mission was all about. Now look again at verse 46. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the doctors both hearing them and asking them questions. Again, the Bible doesn't tell us, uh, it doesn't tell us what those questions were. But those suggested questions in our special music provides a springboard that will allow us to look just a little closer as to who Jesus really was. What's your name, son? On my father's side, my name is Jesus. My mother's side, my name is Jesus. But on my father's side, they call me Emmanuel. Now, Jesus meant name, it means Jehovah is salvation. And did you know that the name Jesus is mentioned 943 times in the New Testament. And may I say to you this morning that Jesus is the sweetest name that I know. As his inheritance on his mother's side, his mother's side, he became a human being forever to be identified with mankind. Now, Jesus did not make believe become a man. In every sense of the word, he was fully human, possessing all the frailties and the weaknesses that you and I have. But many will say that Jesus really was not like us, that he was not as we are in the world, that he was divine. And therefore, when uh, he had a big advantage over us uh, when it comes to overcoming temptation. Turn with me, please, to the book of Peter, 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1. If you have your Bible with you, with you please open it and let's use it. We're going to the scriptures this morning. You might want to call this somewhat a Bible study. That's 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4. One of the most beautiful promises in the Bible. Are you there yet? Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious what? Promises that by these promises you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Yes, Jesus had a divine nature, and it was that divine nature that allowed him to overcome temptation. But I want to tell you this morning that you and I through the promises in God's word, that we too can be possessors of that divine nature. 
Can I hear an amen? amen? How beautiful that is. Now others say that he possessed the unfallen nature of Adam before Adam sinned. If that were the case, then he definitely would have a decided advantages over us. But that is not, not the case. In Adam's unfallen state, Satan did not have access to him 24-7, dogging his every step as he does with us and as he did with Christ. Turn to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 2. I'm going to wait. I want you there. Hebrews chapter 2. And we're going to look at what kind of nature did Christ possess? Did he have a nature that gave him a decided advantage over us? Hebrews chapter 2. And look at verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took place of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Did you know that it was absolutely necessary for Jesus to take the same flesh and blood that we are made of in order that he might be able to die for us. For you see, deity cannot sink and die. Now look at verse 16. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. It says that in all things he was made like unto his brethren. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Now listen to me. As a man, he lived upon earth. As a man, he ascended to heaven. As a man, he is the substitute for humanity. As a man, he lived to make intercession for us. And as a man, he will come again with kingly power and glory to receive those who love him. And for whom? According to John 14, verse 3, he is even right now preparing a place. Now that's all on his mother's side. But on his father's side, he's called Emmanuel. Now turn to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 7. You've got to turn to this. These are important scriptures. Isaiah chapter 7. We're just going to look at one verse there. And then from there we're going to go to Isaiah chapter Okay, chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 7. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive. Who was that virgin? Mary. Shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel is more uh, of a title than it is a name. Emmanuel means God with us. And it gives the message, the beautiful message, that the Almighty God, the creator of all things, was going to dwell with man. But that man, that son, has many names. Now go over to chapter 9 of Isaiah. Just a couple chapters over. And look at verse 6. 
For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called, say it with me, Wonderful Wow. How old are you? On my mother's side now, I'm 12 years. But on my father's side, I've just always been. From his father's side, there has never been a time when the divine Son of God did not exist with the Father. Turn to Micah. That's one of the minor prophets. To the right a little ways. Micah chapter 5. Very important scripture that tells us a lot about our Savior. And you know, as you turn, let me just say this. Uh, you may be thinking to yourself, well, I'm so acquainted with all these scriptures. But I want to tell you something. Every time we read them over, is an opportunity for God to put new light into our minds. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Okay, Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee, out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is, to be ruler in Israel. And notice the last part, whose goings have been from of old, from everlasting. Now, you know, we can understand to everlasting, but can you understand from everlasting? I cannot comprehend that. Now turn to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 8. Uh, this is a scripture that talks about our Lord uh, under the, uh, I can't think of the word for it, uh, symbol of wisdom. Uh, it's one that we don't very often look at and read in connection with our Lord. But it tells us a lot about him. Proverbs chapter 8. Are you there? Amen. Look at verse 22. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. I was set up from how long? Everlasting. From everlasting, from the beginning, wherever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. And Jesus, using this same language, said to the Jews, don't turn, just jot it down. In John 8, verse 42, he said, I proceeded and came forth from God. Neither came I of myself but he sent me. The book of Proverbs chapter 8 is talking plan of salvation incarnation language. In verse 22, look again at verse 22. I was set up from everlasting. The Hebrew word for uh, set up there has several meanings. Four of which are Carnation, incarnation language. And all four are equally applicable in this verse. The first one is poured out as in a drink offering. Install. Ordained. Anointed. Now instead of set up, the Wycliffe Bible reads like this. From without beginning I was ordained. The Amplified Bible, from everlasting, I was established and ordained. God's Word translation, I was appointed from everlasting. Now commenting on this scripture in Proverbs, uh, let me just share. Ellen White wrote, she said that Christ was set up from everlasting to be our substitute 
and surety. Can I hear an amen? amen? Before the world was made, it was arranged that the divinity of Christ should be enshrouded in humanity. And Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 5 says, A body, said Christ, hast thou prepared me. But he did not come in human form until the fullness of time was fulfilled. And then he came to our world, a babe in Bethlehem. Praise God. Hallelujah. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 20, Peter says, He was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Where are you from? On my mother's side, I'm from Bethlehem. But on my father's side, it's New Jerusalem. You know, Jesus, our blessed Savior, he left that glorious city called the New Jerusalem, where by his father's side, he ruled the universe. He left it all to come to this dark world to be made of no reputation to take the form of a servant, to be made in the likeness of men, to humble himself, and to become obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Philippians 2, verses 7 and 8. What's your plan? On my mother's side, I'll be crucified. But on my father's side, in three days, I'll arise and I'll sit by my father's side. On his mother's side, he was crucified. But on his father's side, three days later, he came forth from the tomb, a victorious conqueror. When he ascended back into heaven, he returned to his father's side. Now, we're going to get a little bit deeper now in our study. During the Hebrews, Chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to go just a little deeper in the Word now. We can't go too deep because uh, my mind is not capable of going too deep. Okay, Hebrews chapter 10. When Jesus, I repeat, when He ascended Back into heaven, he returned to where? Where did I say he returned to? His father's side. All right, verse 2, verse 12, Hebrews 10, 12. But this man talking about Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, he sat down on the right hand of God. Now go over a couple chapters to Hebrews 12 and look there at verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down where? Right hand of the throne of God. Now, you got to listen very closely here. According to the typology of the earthly sanctuary, upon his ascension, Christ should have entered the first apartment of the heavenly sanctuary, and he should have remained there until time for the judgment to begin, at which time he would then have moved into the second apartment to participate in the judgment work. But, since the throne of God was located in the most holy apartment, and since Jesus is uh, at his ascension is described as sitting at the right hand of the throne of God, some have conjectured that he bypassed the first apartment and went straight into the holy apartment. Are you following me? If that is true, it would mean that the 2300 days of Daniel 8 
is without a viable explanation. It would mean that the typology of the earthly sanctuary is rendered meaningless. Now follow me closely. In Daniel chapter 7 and verse 8, there the Ancient of Days is described, and it says there that His throne, speaking of the Father, the Ancient of Days, that His throne was like the fiery flame, and its wheels as burning fire. Now wheels on the throne of God would indicate that it is a movable throne. And you can compare this with Ezekiel chapter 1 where there the throne of God is definitely pictured as movable. Now the short answer is this. It is that the throne of God was movable and at the ascension of Christ, it moved into the first apartment to allow Christ as our great high priest to mediate for us in the direct presence of his Father. For you see, unlike the earthly priest who officiated in the earthly sanctuary, Christ as our heavenly high priest, he was holy and undefiled, sinless, and therefore, there was no need of a separating veil between he and his father. Now the song said, he was the son of God, yet the son of man. He came to our world as a man. He ascended back to his heavenly home as both a man and as God fully qualified to sit down at the right hand of the throne of his father, a place that he had occupied from the days of eternity. Brother Bill, come on up and take your place. And yet, mysteries of mysteries and wonders of wonders, as he sits upon that throne, Following his return to heaven, things are now different. For you see, he sits there now as one with the human race. A tie that he will retain throughout eternity. Can you understand that? Can you understand that kind of love? That the almighty God would condescend to come to this world and forever become one of us. I've heard the comparison that it would be like if you had the ability to create an ant, which you don't, and, but, and, and the ants got in trouble in order for the you to save them, you would become an ant yourself and remain one forever. That's a good comparison of what it was like. These words in the song are true, but they are incomprehensible. Christ was fully man, yet at the same time, he was also fully God. I don't understand it, and I know that you don't understand it, but I believe it because the Bible tells me so. Divinity took humanity that humanity might touch humanity. With his human arm, Christ encircled the race, the human race. And with his divine arm, he grasped the throne of the infinite God. Jesus is our Savior, our Redeemer, our wisdom, our sanctification, our righteousness. He is the Alpha and Omega, the A and the Z, the beginning and the end, and everything else in between. Would you say amen? amen. 
He is the one of whom the angel said to his sorrowing disciples at his ascension, This same Jesus shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go. That's on his father's side. His mother's side. That's on his mother's side. He will come in the clouds of glory as King of kings and Lord of lords, and that is on his father's side. But on both his mother and his father's side, he is the chief among 10,000 and altogether lovely. He is the bright and morning star. He is the lily of the valley. Would you say amen? Yeah. Amen. Would you stand to your feet as we have the benediction? And I'm going to ask Brother Lee, standing right there where you are, would you pray a little benediction, a benediction prayer for us? Amen. You may be seated.